Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tingo Echo. Optimisme is een verantwoordelijkheid als er een natuurramp gebeurt. Vertrouw jij dan je leven toe aan het feit dat mobiele telefoons en internetverbindingen nog werken? Vertrouw je daar het leven van je gezinsleden aan toe? Ik dacht het niet. Amateurradio, communicatie die altijd blijft werken. Und auch heute ist der Deutschlandrundspruch des DRRC wieder mit im Programm von Papa Alpha 00 News. Wir freuen uns, dass wir in den Niederlanden landesweit auf 145,575 MHz auf dem Relais Papa India 3 Uniform Tango Romeo ausgestrahlt werden und grüßen alle Hörer in Papa Alpha und in den niederländischen Überseegebieten in der Karibik, die uns auf PI3 UTR via Echolink zuhören. Wir wünschen euch einen guten Empfang und schicken herzliche 73 aus Deutschland. In uw volgende uitzending bevat schokkende voorbeelden van hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. Bij jonge mensen onder de 18 kan de aanwezigheid van een volwassene tijdens de uitzending gewenst zijn. Massive and expensive equipment marks the professional radio station. But in the amateur field, radio parts often include pieces of assorted junk ingeniously assembled by operators who are called hams and who take up broadcasting as a hobby. The following program contains strong language throughout. Zo, dan staat het weekend weer voor de deur. Ja, dat was me het weekje wel. Wordt er nog gefrontest? Dat weet ik niet. Of wordt er nog gefossenjaagd? Moet je in Elektron kijken of die kars CQPA of op hamnies.nl? Nou ja, dat moeten we dan vanavond maar even doen. Heb je zin in koffie? Ja, lekker. Oké. Okay. As an expert in the field, I want to expressly advise everyone to not listen to PA00 News on Friday evening. Goedenavond, dit is de lange uitzending van de Daily Minutes, ook bekend als PNLDL Nieuws. We beginnen vanavond met de vijf Nederlandstalige Daily Minutes uitzendingen van afgelopen week. En aan het eind van de uitzending is er zoals altijd de Duitsland toen sproeg. Dit is Papa Alpha 0, ik hoop Tengo. Ik hoop voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag, 29 augustus 2016. Dit is het beeld van maandag. Vandaag is een morsencode, dat is wel een herhaling, uh, maar er is wel een nieuw SSTV plaatje met een close-up van een waterdier. De foto is gemaakt door een mede-amateur. Het doet vandaag nog een beetje kalm aan, dus ik smokkel een beetje. Maar vandaag een uh, stuk van James Wade, Whisky Bravo 8, Sierra India Whisky. Hij is van de Morse Telegraph Club. Dat is een vereniging van voormalig beroepsmatige telegrafisten. Ze houden contact met elkaar via een virtueel telegrafienetwerk, inclusief lijnstroom, dat via een speciaal interface werkt en via internet. James vertelt iets over zijn organisatie en over iets waar de meeste amateurtelegrafisten niets van af weten. Namelijk dat er twee verschillende morsenalfabetten hebben bestaan die tot ver in de jaren 80 in de VS gebruikt zijn. De eerste is de American Morse Code, die werd vooral door de beroepstelegrafisten in de VS gebruikt. En de tweede is de Continental Code. De laatste van die twee is wat wij als centamateurs gebruiken. De uitzending is vandaag iets langer. Move on to other areas, but uh, the Morse Telegraph Club was founded in 1943. Uh, originally as a fraternal organization for retired uh, railroad and commercial telegraphers. And uh, it's evolved over the years into a historical association, and uh, its purpose is to perpetuate the knowledge of the traditions and history of telegraphy and the telegraph industry. Now, it's important to understand at the outset, and it's something many people don't know throughout the world, and, and likewise many radio amateurs don't know, is that there are two different Morse codes. Uh, the original Morse code, as developed by Morris and Vale, is called the American Morse Code. Uh, and the American Morse Code is somewhat different than the international code that radio amateurs use. Uh, as originally conceived, it had, uh, first of all, spaced characters. For example, uh, Dedadit, as R in the international code that's used by radio amateurs in the maritime services and the militaries and so forth, Uh, but in the American Morse code, that would be an F. And uh, likewise, an R in American Morse code would actually be dit, dit, dit. It'd actually have an internal space that's internal to the character. And so there's about, oh, uh, say, uh, 10 or so of the letters that are different. 
Uh, there's some letters that have alternate meeting, uh, meanings. As that is, there's some Morse characters that have alternate meanings in the American Morse Code. And the numer- uh, numerals are different. And so this is the original Morse Code that was developed by, by Morris and Vail. Now, uh, when they laid the first undersea cables, uh, the, the space characters turned out to be difficult to dis- uh, distinguish. Uh, they didn't understand these concepts of, uh, you know, reactants and long undersea cables and, you know, the signal distortions that might occur. And they realized as they worked with the first successful undersea cables that they could not use the original Morse code because they couldn't distinguish the different dash lengths. There's three different dash lengths, and they couldn't distinguish these spaced characters. So a uh, uh, committee meeting was held on the continent of Europe, uh, and it developed what's now called the International Morse Code, or actually, technically, the Continental Code. The Continental Code eliminated the spaced characters, and it eliminated the three different dash lanes that uh, exist in the original American Morse code. And it is the continental code that radio amateurs use, and that is generally used throughout the world. Now, about the time that this occurred, the American telegraph industry, that is primarily in the U.S., Canada, uh, Mexico, and the like, was so well established that it was impractical to retrain all these telegraph operators in the new international standard. So the American commercial and railroad telegraph industries stayed with the original American Morse code. And this continued to be used in commercial applications into the 1980s uh, when landline or commercial telegraphy was uh, finally eliminated entirely uh, just through technological progress and the like. So, you know, this is a real long and complex way of saying that there are really two American, or there's two Morse codes that were commonly used in North America, one of which is this older American Morris Code, and that was used by commercial and railroad telegraphers, say, for example, people who worked for Western Union, Postal Telegraph, uh, you know, the stock brokerages, uh, press services, things of that nature. And then there's also this international Morris Code, properly called the Continental Code, which is used by radio amateurs, maritime services, etc., so our organization focuses on the history of the telegraph industry and telegraphy, and its primary emphasis is this, this older Morse code. Uh, many of our members are retired from uh, the railroad and commercial telegraph industry, and then, of course, we have people who are also members because they're uh, amateur historians or professional historians or the radio amateurs, and they want to learn about the history of telegraphy, how how it evolved, and, and you know the whole the whole historical foundation for uh, uh, Morris and uh, and the like. So that sort of describes the foundation of the Morris Telegraph Club, and gives a little bit of background into why you know it's a unique organization. Um, so at, at this point in time, um, in your organization, how many people do you think there are? That are non-radio amateurs that are um, that are members and participate in, in the activities. I would have to estimate that, but I would say probably about thirty to forty percent uh, were primarily commercial or railroad telegraph operators. Uh, the remaining membership is um, you know radio amateurs, uh, historians, people of that nature that have an interest in the technology. Now, keep in mind that many of the people who worked in the commercial and railroad telegraph industry are what you might call bilingual. They also served in, say, World War II, et cetera, and they were trained also in the Continental Code. But their primary background in telegraphy is related to working in the railroad uh, or commercial telegraph industry. So is it a, if a person is very familiar with uh, and, and does... You say they're proficient at CW at whatever speed, okay? Um, if someone starts sending the other code to them, um, how confusing does it get? I mean, I mean, if there's only a, a few characters that are that are out, it seems to me that would have almost uh, uh, 
little relevance. In other words, I think you'd wind up getting, you know, 90% of the content anyhow. Well, I think that, uh, you know, certainly a, someone who's proficient in international code, uh, and that is by proficient, I mean he can treat it as a language. Uh, you'll find that as one learns telegraphy, whatever version it is, um, there's a, you go from essentially the initial phase where you're sort of translating in your head, and then over time it evolves into a natural language. And that's the point where, say, an operator can copy in his head, treat it just like he would the spoken language. Uh, he can only, you know, you don't need only maybe write down or make notes about information that, that's necessary. But essentially he listens to Morris in the same way he does to a natural language and he comprehends it in the same manner. So that's what I would call a proficient operator. An operator at that stage can learn American Morris quite easily. Uh, it usually just takes, you know, a few weeks of, of study. Now keep in mind that uh, some of the letters are different. Some of the uh, some of them have alternate meanings, meanings which really can confuse a guy. For example, uh, you know, a J in American Morse code is da 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 da, and <laughs> R is da da da, and you know, so on. And so, and then of course you have the spaced characters. Y is did it did it, Z is did it did it, and so this can really throw off uh, an operator, particularly. As operators go up in speed, they tend to hear whole words, they tend to hear whole patterns. And so yeah, there is some effort involved in picking up the American Morse code, but certainly a proficient operator can do it with relative ease. I mean, you have to put a little effort in, but you know, one can learn it, and they can become uh, quite uh, proficient and comfortable with it. Well, I know back they were giving the live um, CW exams on the FCC tests, um, what they did at that particular, well, there was different methods by which they did it, but at the period of time when I took the test, they sent an entire section or a whole QSO, uh, and then they would give you a multiple choice test. Said, well, you know, uh, what was the guy's name, and what was his QTH, and what was the signal of one person, and uh, they would ask these. I mean, you had to you had to know the answers. I mean, there was no way you could fake it, but uh, you didn't have to know. Let's put it this way. If you missed a few characters here and there, that wasn't counted against you because they were asking you about the text. Uh, prior to that, I understand that... Uh, the website van de Morse Telegraph Club is simpelweg www.morsetelegraphclub.org. En Telegraph Club, dat schrijf je met PH. Morse, telegra, PH, C-L-U-B, punt org. Uh, op de site is bijzonder veel historische informatie te vinden over met name het beroep van de telegrafist in de VS. Onder het kopje switchboard links kun je onder het kopje internet telegrafie info vinden over hoe je mee kunt doen aan het virtuele land telegrafie netwerk van de voormalige beroepstelegrafisten. Dat kan in beide alfabetten. Er zijn ook veel Australische voormalig telegrafisten lid en die zijn ook gewoon met ons continental alfabet.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate van vandaag 30 augustus 2016. Dat is het bulletin van dinsdag. Vandaag hebben we Mosse en een SSTV afbeelding in PD90 met een foto van een beroemdheid in de amateurwereld. Vandaag hebben we opnieuw een iets wat langere uitzending met een Engelstalig item. Dit keer gaan we opnieuw in op de nummerzenders. Speciaal interessant voor de mensen die vorig jaar de lange serie over dat onderwerp geheel of gedeeltelijk gemist hebben. Dit is Hobbyscope. Een projectie van elektronica, wetenschap en hobby in stereo. Ja, en eerst beginnen we met nieuws van het Hobby Scope Team. Er is een nieuw meetnetwerk opgezet dat de naam Barretta heeft... naar de papegaai van Piet, PD2 HPE. Overigens is iedere gelijkenis met andere onderdelen van deze uitzending puur toevallig. Barretta staat hier voor Boven Regionaal Amateur Radio Experimentele Transmitter Test Applicatie... Door het meetnetwerk hoef je niet meer op de repeater de microfoon kort in te drukken, zoals veel mensen dat helaas doen, wat nogal irritant is, om te horen of je er overheen komt. Op de PI2 NOS locaties staan extra ontvangers op 431.600. Het meetnetwerk beschikt net als de repeaterkaart over een sterkte weergave op de verschillende ontvangers. Je kunt daarnaast je eigen uitzending terugluisteren via de website. En verder zit er een deviatiemeter in waarmee je precies en met zekerheid kunt vaststellen of je met die Bami Porto nou te hard of juist te zacht modelleert. Rechts op de Hobbyscope site zit nu een knop meetnetwerk en daarop kun je de uitzendingen op 431,600 terugluisteren. Er is daar uiteraard geen shift nodig en ook geen CTCSS. Je ziet direct je rapport zodra je de microfoon indrukt op de verschillende ontvangers. Zodra je de microfoon loslaat hoor je je eigen uitzending terug wat op de site wordt weergegeven en met een rood knipperend plaatje van een papegaai. Er zit dus nog meer in en er zijn ook nog meer plannen. Hobbyscope.nl dus en klik op de knop. Dit is Hobbyscope. Doordat het voorgaande nieuws is toegevoegd aan de uitzending die eigenlijk al bijna klaar was, is de uitzending vandaag wat langer geworden dan anders en hij was al vrij lang. We gaan nu in het Engels over op het item over nummerzenders. You're listening to Skeptoid. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Spy Radio. Numbers Stations. Today we're going to point our skeptical eye at something that's been intriguing amateur radio enthusiasts since the Cold War. So-called numbers stations. Mysterious shortwave radio broadcasts sending coded messages to the world at regular intervals. Some say they are government intelligence agencies sending instructions to deep cover operatives in foreign countries. Some say they are integral parts of nuclear arsenals. Some even say that if you're caught listening to the wrong one at the wrong time, you might mysteriously disappear one night. Shortwave radio occupies the frequency range between 3 and 30 megahertz, and most numbers stations can be found in the range between 2 and 25 megahertz. The benefit of shortwave is that your transmission can potentially cover the entire world, given the right conditions. It's one way, but if all you need to do is send someone else a message that you want to be sure they're able to receive, shortwave is a great way to do it. Some histories state that numbers stations have been around in one form or another since World War I, but it was toward the end of the Cold War in the 1980s when they really started gaining popularity. Many early numbers stations used Morse code or an actual person's speaking voice, but today most numbers stations use automated voices, like you hear when you call information on the telephone. Today, many of the numbers stations are switching to single sideband, The typical numbers station begins its broadcast with some recognizable tone or statement and then proceeds to read off five-character code groups. It is widely suspected that these are encrypted messages that can be decoded by a listener using a one-time pad. A one-time pad is a character replacement key that's used only once. Since it's never reused, one-time pads are extremely difficult, in fact virtually impossible, to crack. You can Google for numbers stations, and you'll find plenty of websites that list them by frequency and by schedule, so if you get a hold of a shortwave receiver, you can actually sit down and listen to them. They are real, and they are broadcasting, right now. Now, whenever I hear claims about spy networks or secret coded radio broadcasts, 
my skeptical radar goes into red alert mode, like Money Penny's pulse when 007 enters the room. If you tell me there's a mysterious coded radio broadcast on shortwave at the same time every day, my first reaction is not likely to be to grab my tinfoil hat and shout, THE GOVERNMENT'S SPYING ON ME! When I first heard about numbers stations, I asked a few friends and I got some pretty reasonable answers. For one thing, all over the world are floating oceanographic buoys, and all throughout every day they transmit their tide, temperature, and weather data via radio. I did a bit of searching online and found a lot of information about a number of different networks of these buoys, but none broadcast in the shortwave band. Rather, they are quite a bit higher, above 900 megahertz. They also use radio modems for data transmission. There would be no need for them to include spoken text. But even with these differences, it seems likely that at least some of the mysterious radio stations that amateurs have found are probably nothing more interesting than oceanographic buoys or other remote automated stations transmitting who knows what kind of mundane information. But most of the numbers stations you can read about online are clearly nothing of the kind. One of the most well-known numbers stations is called the Lincolnshire Poacher, named after the song that the broadcast always starts with. Enthusiasts using direction finders have tracked it down to an array of curtain antennas inside the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force Base at Akrotiri on the island of Cyprus. Note that Cyprus is right off the coast of Syria and the Middle East. After the introductory music, the Lincolnshire Poacher repeats some coded five-digit series, which nobody has ever managed to decode, presumably excluding the intended recipients. The prevailing theory that many of these numbers stations are in fact used by intelligence agencies to transmit information to spies located in foreign countries has been proven true in at least a few cases. In 2001, nine days after 9-11, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency arrested one of its own, senior Cuba analyst Anna Montez. Among a wealth of other evidence against her, she had been using a commercially available shortwave radio receiver to receive coded messages from a numbers station known to be originating in Cuba. And this was only strike two of a series of interceptions of intelligence broadcasts from Cuba. One of the best-known number stations, called Atención, came into the limelight at the 1998 conviction of the so-called WASP network of spies from Cuba. The FBI had entered their apartment and copied a cryptography program off their laptop computer. It was found that every day they would listen to the Atención station, enter the numbers into their laptop, and use the program to decode each day's instructions using a one-time pad. Here's a sample of Atención. Atención, tres, ocho, nueve, cinco, nueve, cero, cuatro, cuatro, siete, tres, tres, ocho, nueve, cinco, nueve, seis, seis, tres, ocho, nueve, cinco, nueve, Some numbers stations have purposes that are more obscure, even though they may still have a government connection. One of them is called Yosemite Sam. Yosemite Sam began broadcasting in 2004 and has been tracked down and found to be located near Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is near a whole host of military facilities, including the Los Alamos National Laboratory and the White Sands Missile Range. Sam transmits an 800 millisecond data burst followed by a line from a 1949 Bugs Bunny cartoon on a number of different frequencies. Every 40 seconds, the broadcast moves to the next frequency and repeats. Here's a sample transmission. Of course, the Russians are in on the game, too, demonstrated by this station, known simply as The Buzzer, which broadcasts around the clock from a Moscow suburb. 
Why transmit a meaningless buzz all the time? There are a few theories. One is simply that in order to keep a frequency, you have to actually use it, or it will be reallocated to someone else. The Russians may want to keep this frequency open and available should they need it in a time of national emergency. The same might apply to Yosemite Sam or to any of a number of other numbers stations. In fact, this explanation need not even be military. Private companies may also have similar needs. Amateur radio enthusiasts might also have some reason to do this. Russia has about 150 radioisotope thermoelectric-powered lighthouses along their Arctic coast, and it's been postulated that the buzzer might somehow be used in monitoring them. There are other perfectly rational explanations for at least some number stations that don't involve Tom Clancy scenarios. It's been suggested more than once that some of the number stations, particularly those coming from Central and South America, could be drug traffickers giving delivery instructions. What about the stories that you can be arrested if you're caught listening to numbers stations? Assuming you're not a spy who actually is decoding these messages in a treasonous kind of way, you're not doing anything wrong, you're just receiving electromagnetic radiation that someone else is transmitting into your home. Lucille Ball's dental fillings did that. In some countries, notably the UK, this is actually illegal. But it has nothing to do with numbers stations. In the UK, it's simply illegal to receive any radio transmission that you're not licensed for. Obviously, it's the type of crime that ordinary listeners not involved in some misuse of the airwaves are unlikely to actually get arrested for. The thing I like about numbers stations is that it's one case where the spooky explanation, the one that would appeal most to the conspiracy theorists, actually turns out to be the right one in at least some instances. We do know that some number stations do exist for the purpose of international espionage. And that's pretty cool. Do all number stations exist for that purpose? Certainly not. There are a number of plausible non-espionage scenarios that, if true, would result in broadcasts consistent with some of the number stations out there. They're a fun mystery, made even more fun by the high stakes of the spy game. You're listening to Skeptoid. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. Deze mensen zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Eco Tingo Eco voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate van vandaag, 31 augustus 2016. Dat is bulletin van woensdag. 
Vandaag is er Mosse en een SSTV plaatje in PD90. Er is vandaag nog wat weinig nieuws, dus ik moet helaas nog even improviseren met wat Engelse bijdragen. Ik heb drie items van de Engineer Guy. Today, video chatting on a phone seems natural, yet for years the public resisted video chat. The device in this photo, it's from 1964, shows the Bell Systems picture phone. Although you see grandma enjoying a chat with her daughter and granddaughter, very few people, let alone grandparents, use the device. Bell lost a half billion dollars. Here's the amazing story of the failure, but more important, near revolutionary success of the very first mass manufactured phone for video chatting. This device was meant to be the most revolutionary communication medium of the century, but failed miserably as a consumer product. In 1964, the mighty Bell system, the great monopoly that solely owned the telephone system, introduced the picture phone. They hoped that everyone would replace their voice-only phone with a picture phone, even though Bell charged $160 a month for the phone in its service, about a thousand in today's dollars. Technically, it was an amazing achievement. Bell used the existing twisted pair copper wire of the telephone network, not the broadband lines like today, to produce black and white video on a screen about five inches square. And amazingly for the time, it used a CCD-based camera which had size and height control so the image could be adjusted without moving the picture phone itself. To spark interest in the picture phone, Bell created picture booths in New York, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. to introduce the phones to the public at a cost of about 20 bucks a minute, over 150 in today's dollars. Bell hoped for a billion dollar business with a million phones set up by 1980 and 12 million subscribers by the year 2000. But in 1964, only 71 patrons used the picture booths in the first six months, and six years later, the number of users fell to zero. The picture phone itself limped along with a handful of customers until Bell withdrew it in 1978 after investing some 500 million dollars. The truly interesting aspect isn't the failure. The picture phone had the problems of any new invention, attracting users and producing enough to lower the cost. More fascinating to me than the failure is how close picture phone came to being the internet. In the 1950s and early 1960s, the Bell system engineers who designed the picture phone followed the speculations about a new coming media revolution. So they thought of an interconnected world, they knew that as long as customers used telephone lines only for voice calls, they had little reason to pay for broadband lines to the home. Copper would work well enough. But with picture phone, they could justify the cost of upgrading local lines. So they designed the picture phone to spark consumer interest and to generate cash to build an all-digital switch network to provide, in their words, a wide spectrum of consumer services, including picture phone. In fact, picture phone did deliver data in a proto-internet way. The phones connected mainframe computers, and an add-on let users share 35 millimeter slides and a flip-out mirror captured documents placed on a desk. The picture phone didn't do its job well enough. The video, although cutting edge for the time, was still choppy, and sharing documents on a 5 inch by 5 inch screen was less than ideal. The root of the failure lies in Bell's monopoly powers. It could not cross-subsidize the picture phone, introduce it at a low rate to build demand, because this would leave them open to charges of monopoly abuse. So in a way, the picture phone fit in nowhere. Too expensive for home, too limited for business, but it does remind us when looking at failure to look carefully at the details, because in them is often the path to the future. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy. When I was 10 years old, my mother gave me an old Kodak Brownie camera. I was disappointed because it looked like a box with a hole in it. I didn't realize how this simple box revolutionized photography. Did it change the way American families think of themselves and recall their own histories? The Brownie camera was the brainchild of George Eastman. In 1871, this 17 year old bank clerk took up photography. It wasn't a simple thing in those days. In Eastman's own words, it took a pack horse load of equipment including a sink because making photos was messy business. It involved coating glass plates with egg whites. His first step was to get rid of the sink to make the process dry. Eastman worked in his mother's kitchen to make dry plates, even boiling his chemicals in her teapot. He went into business as the Eastman Dry Plate Company. Eastman felt he could make money from his plates, but only if there existed a small, simple camera to use them. This started him on a 20-year quest. 
His first camera in 1885 included a key feature, a roll of film. Eastman took coatings from his dry glass plates and transferred it to flexible paper. Although it was now inconvenient to take pictures, it cost $45 for the camera, an exorbitant price in 1885. Over the next three years, Eastman improved his camera, but it still cost $25, again too much, although it carried for the first time one of the greatest trademark names ever. To name the camera, Eastman looked for a simple word that could be pronounced in every language. Eastman's favorite letter was K. He said it was strong, incisive, firm, and unyielding. From this feeling, he conjured up Kodak. With profits from these cameras, Eastman spent 10 more years perfecting his ultimate camera, the Brownie. It sold for $1 plus 15 cents for film. In its first year, 1900, 5,000 of them flew off the shelves, spreading across the globe. In 1904, for example, when the Dalai Lama came down from his Tibetan capital for the first time, he brought with him his Kodak camera. In spite of the success of the Brownie, Eastman continued creating new cameras until he got a painful spinal condition that made him inactive. Always the man of action, Eastman made a plan. He tidied up his will, then asked his doctor to show him exactly where his heart was. In 1932, George Eastman shot himself through the heart, leaving behind a yellow-lined piece of paper with the words, To my friends, my work is done. Why wait? And what work that was. This year alone, Americans will take 70 billion photos, not simply photographs, but memories to be shared for years, all started by George Eastman and his brownie camera. No doubt during this Halloween season, you'll hear some movie or some recording that has this familiar yet eerie sound. That sound gave birth to the greatest gift from engineers to the arts, the electronic synthesizer. The synthesizer began in the 1920s with Professor Leon Theremin. In a Leningrad engineering lab, he played around with the latest technology, radio. It fascinated Theremin because radio changed electricity into sound. He brought two parts of the radio close together, so they made a sound like the squeal from putting a microphone too near a speaker. This propelled him, in his own words, to give these sounds a musical soul. He built an instrument where instead of physically bringing the two parts together, the performer's body would create the squeal. He would just wave his hands in front of the instrument, plucking music from the air. You've likely heard the theremin, as the instrument became known, in the 1950 sci-fi classic, The Day the Earth Stood Still. But well before that, theremin toured the world and captured headlines. The New York Times called it ether music. The Chicago Tribune said that theremin mysteriously reproduces music. Einstein called it as significant as when primitive man produced sound from a bowstring. The instrument made quite a splash until 1938 when Theremin disappeared abruptly. Kidnapped by Soviet agents, he was sent to a labor camp until he agreed to work for the KGB. But Leon Theremin had planted a seed. In the late 1950s, a 14-year-old boy built a Theremin from plans he found in a magazine. By age 20, he began making them commercially, selling enough to pay for his engineering education. The student, Robert Moog, used what he'd learned about electronic music from the theremin and built in 1964 the world's first synthesizer. With Moog's synthesizer, the child of Leon Theremin's wonderful instrument, electronic music became world famous with one of the best-selling classical albums of all time, Switched on Bach.
Deel de minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. Dit is Papa Alfa 0 Echo Tango Echo voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate voor vandaag, 1 september 2016. Dit is het bulletin van donderdag. Vandaag is een Mosche en een SSTV beeld in, let wel, PD120. Het is de payload van de ballon van de ballonvossenjacht in 2013, plus een insert met een close-up. De afgelopen week werd ik door flink wat mensen getipt over een artikel dat ging over een buitenaards signaal dat ontvangen werd. Het bericht bevatte redelijk wat onjuistheden en dat maakt het is komkommertijd wat voorzichtig. Volgens verschillende versies van het artikel zou de organisatie CETI bijvoorbeeld onderzoek doen naar het verschijnsel. CETI is echter geen organisatie, het is de Amerikaanse afkorting voor het onderzoek naar buitenaards leven. Het bericht met een flinterdunne basis verscheen in deze komkommertijd op ongelooflijk veel plekken en ook op diverse amateurwebsites. Vandaag werd bekend dat het Russische signaal, waar het hele bericht op gebaseerd was, bij nader onderzoek toch niet uit de ruimte afkomstig was, maar van een bijzonder aardse storingsbron. Voordat ik aan opnieuw een Engelstalig onderdeel begin, eerst nog een paar korte mededelingen. Nog tien dagen en dan is de ballonfossenjacht alweer. Die komt met rassen schreden dichterbij, dus poets je pijl, ontvangers en antennes op en zorg dat je voldoende slaap krijgt en in topconditie bent. Het L7 zendt tussen de middag momenteel weer de serie Last Man Standing uit. Dat is de Amerikaanse primetime sitcom waarbij meerdere mensen in de serie zich met de zendhobby bezighouden. Ja, Ten slotte, ik streef ernaar om vanavond weer een beetje bij te zijn met de uitzending online plaatsen. Het eerst zal dat lukken met YouTube. Ook vandaag is de uitzending iets langer dan anders. Binnenkort zitten we weer op een minuut of 7 aan 9, wat het gewoonlijk altijd is. Normally all of our weekday bulletins are in Dutch, but due to the lack of news we temporarily do our weekday bulletins partly in English. During weekends, the daily minutes are in English, with amongst others the propagation bulletin for the next week and some DX news. The SSTV image is in PD120 today, normally it's mostly in PD90. You can pick the picture up, for example with your smartphone using the microphone, using the Robot36 app on Android. Today's picture is of the payload of the balloon fox hunt, which will take place September 11. I think this is one of the coolest features of today's smartphones. It knows up from down. Built into the circuitry is a tiny device that can detect changes in orientation and tell the screen to rotate. Now, let me show you uh, what it looks like using an old iPhone. There it is. It's an accelerometer. I'll tell you how this kind of chip works and how it's made, but first some basics of accelerometers. They have two fundamental parts a housing attached to the object, whose acceleration we want to measure, and a mass that, while tethered to the housing, can still move. Here it's a spring with a heavy metal ball. If we move the housing up, the ball lags behind stretching the spring. If we measure how much that spring stretches, we can calculate the force of gravity. You can easily see that three of these could determine the orientations of a three-dimensional object. Well, lying with a z-axis perpendicular to gravity, only the ball on the x-axis spring shows extension. Turn this on its side so that the z-axis points up and only the accelerometer along the spring on that axis stretches. So how does this phone and this chip measure changes in gravity? Well, more complex than the simple ball and spring model, it has the same fundamental elements. Inside the chip, engineers have created a tiny accelerometer out of silicon. It has, of course, a housing that's fixed to the phone and a comb-like section that can move back and forth. That's the seismic mass equivalent to the ball. The spring in this case is the flexibility of the thin silicon tethering it to the housing. Now, clearly, if we can measure the motion of this central section, we can detect changes in orientation. To see how that's done, examine three of the fingers on the accelerometer. The three fingers make up a differential capacitor. That means that if the center section moves, then current will flow. Engineers correlate the amount of flowing current to acceleration. This accelerometer fascinates me, but even more amazing is how they make such a thing. It would seem nearly impossible to make such an intricate device as this tiny smartphone accelerometer. At only 500 microns across, no tiny tools could craft such a thing. Instead, engineers use some unique chemical properties of silicon to etch the accelerometer's fingers in H-shaped sections. Now, to get an idea of how they do this, let me show you how to make a single cantilevered beam, like a diving board, in a small chunk of silicon. Empirically, engineers noticed that if they poured potassium hydroxide on a particular surface of crystalline silicon, it would eat away at the silicon until it forms a pyramidal-shaped hole. This occurs because of the unique crystal structure of silicon. To make a pyramidal hole in silicon, engineers cover all but a small square with a mask impervious to the potassium hydroxide. 
Now, it only etches within the square shape cordoned off by the mask. The potassium hydroxide dissolves silicon faster in the vertical than in the horizontal direction. This is why it makes a pyramidal hole. Now, to make a cantilevered beam, engineers follow these steps. First, mass the surface except for a U-shaped section. At first, the potassium hydroxide will cut two inverse pyramids side by side. As the etching continues, the potassium hydroxide begins to dissolve the silicon between these holes. If we wash it away at just the right point before it dissolves the silicon just underneath the mask, it will leave a small cantilevered beam hanging over a hole with a square bottom. Engineers make smartphone accelerometers using these same methods, but as you can picture, it takes a series of detailed masks to create the intricate structure of a smartphone accelerometer. While complex, a key point is that the whole process can be automated. This is absolutely essential in the miniaturization of technology. Engineers now make all sorts of amazing things at this tiny scale. Micro engines with gears that rotate 300,000 times a minute, nozzles in inkjet printers, and my favorite, micro mirrors that focus light in semiconductor lasers. I'm Bill Hammack, The Engineer Guy. This video is based on a chapter in the book, Eight Amazing Engineering Stories. In the 17th century, this amount of nutmeg would buy you a large house. I bought this for about three bucks at the grocery store. The Europeans thought that nutmeg had powerful medicinal properties. In fact, it was so rare that the English and the Dutch fought wars over it. They decimated a small Indonesian island that was a sole supplier of nutmeg. It seems quaint to us that an economy should depend on a rare spice from an obscure part of the world. But our economy works in exactly the same way. Um, our electronics depend on a tantalum. This is a Motorola Q phone. It's a smartphone. It has the smallest QWERTY keyboard. That's a typewriter keyboard. And my wife loves it because it fits her fingers. In a way, this is made possible by tantalum. Tantalum comes from the minerals columbite, tantalite. They're so often found together that we abbreviate the name to coltan. You can see that it's a hard blue-gray metal. And it's as magic to us as nutmeg was to the Europeans. Let me show you where it is in the cell phone. Now, the U.S. actually has no sources at all of coltan. Australia makes about half of the world's uh, supply. About 2% comes from the Congo in Africa. And there, it decimated the Congo, um, much like nutmeg did in the 17th century. In fact, some people estimate it killed about 5 million people. There we go. Now, look. You can see just a little yellow blob here. That's a tantalum capacitor. It regulates the voltage, and it stores energy in the cell phone. Now, you could make the capacitor out of aluminum, but that would make the, the capacitor a lot larger. And in a cell phone like this that has all sorts of bells and whistles, you want everything as small as possible because that makes everything very cheap. Even though this is just one yellow blob and it doesn't seem like much, a cell phone has about mm, 40 milligrams of tantalum in it. Multiply that by, say, 40 million cell phones, and you can see how you have a lot of tantalum used up. But it's not only this cell phone. All sorts of electronic devices, like this PlayStation 2, have tantalum in them. Hello? Yeah, hi, hon. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know where the uh, nutmeg is. Actually, I have it at work. I'm using it um, to make some of those videos. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Your, your cell phone. I, um... I, I don't know where your cell phone is. Uh-huh. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf s ochtends herhaald. Oei, 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 waarom ben ik nou zo laat? Het is kwart voor zeven. Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tingo Echo voor de Daily Minutes met een nieuwsupdate van vandaag 2 september 2016. Dit is een bulletin van vrijdag. Uh, waar vandaag hebben we enkel moest worden en een SSTV beeld in PD90. Een spectaculaire. Vanavond, vrijdagavond vanaf half elf is er weer de lange uitzending op PI3 UTR. Met nieuws in het Nederlands en internationaal nieuws in het Engels en het Duits. En vergeet niet om vanavond, vrijdagavond dus ook, om het vanaf 2100 uur te luisteren naar de uitzending van PI4AA. Op dezezelfde repeat de PI2NOS en verder op 145.325 en een frequentie op 40 meter plus of minus QRM. Op PI2NOS en op 40 meter is er de gelegenheid om je na afloop in te melden. This mighty machine sparked a revolution in our use of media. It's a Sony Betamax video cassette recorder from 1979. This monster weighs about 36 pounds. The engineer in me finds it fascinating. There's nothing digital. It's a truly analog machine. All moving pieces and parts. Early adopters of the Betamax used it to record television shows, a revolutionary concept at the time, because prior to the Betamax, you had to watch a show when it was broadcast. It threatened the entertainment industry so much that in 1979, they argued that recording television shows at home infringed on their copyright. It all came to a head in a Supreme Court case, Sony Corporation of America versus Universal City Studios, where five justices allowed home recording. Although Sony won this court battle, they ultimately lost out to a machine that used this size tape. This is a VHS recorder made by Sony's great rival, JVC. Both machines solved the same problem, how to store information compactly on a tape. Here's the brilliant innovation used by both machines. The machine grabs the tape, drags it forward as this silver drum starts to spin rapidly. The drum has two electromagnets called heads arranged on opposite sides of the drum that read the magnetic information on the tape. That rotating head allowed for a compact recorder. In many previous recorders, the magnetic heads didn't move, only the tape. Because there was a limit to how fast the tape could move, it took a lot of tape, about a 7-inch reel to record an hour, which meant that a movie would need two 7-inch reels inside a cassette. So the rotating heads dramatically reduced the amount of tape needed, reducing the size to where it could be easily held in a cassette. So if the machines are so similar, why did Betamax lose to JVC? Many thought the Betamax machine would win. It had the better image quality, and the Betamax is decidedly better built. Compare ejecting a tape on the Betamax to the VHS. First, watch the Betamax. Note how smooth it is. And then watch the VHS. That's abrupt and will wear out the mechanism. Yet, to my engineer's eye, the VHS was the better solution. First, the VHS was lighter than the Betamax, 29 and a half pounds compared to 36 pounds for this Betamax machine. That's a huge difference for a mass manufactured object. It impacts everything from material costs to assembly time to shipping costs. So, at the low end of the market, the VHS machines were cheaper than Sony's Betamax. Second, the earliest Betamax tapes played for only one hour, VHS played for two hours, enough time for a movie. The ultimate killer, though, was the rental market. Well, Betamax focused its ads and energies on time shifting. Their ads featured headlines like, watch whatever, whenever. Well, JVC, the maker of the VHS system, created relationships with the nascent video rental industry. When this market grew, VHS dominated in titles. And when you could for a while find both formats, eventually retailers began giving shelf space to the slightly more dominant brand, which then dominated even more. So, the Betamax versus VHS dispels the notion that simply being first to market is the most important issue. It reminds us that technical excellence in one area isn't enough, here the superior picture quality of Betamax, but that all technical aspects matter. For any mass manufactured object, the winner is usually the one that is just good enough. I'm Bill Hammack, the engineer guy. Yeah, come in. Hi. Hi. It's um, this one right here. Okay.
Ah, where's the bathroom? Uh, out here, to your left. Be right back. All right, good. Now, we've all heard of gases, liquids, and solids, but there's a fourth type of matter. Plasma. The University of Illinois, and especially its lawyers, do not approve of these actions. They wish to note that engaging in such actions can result in injury and even death, in addition to being a criminal activity. They particularly do not approve of the actions that follow. Yeah, hi, Ellen. Cut the power. Yeah, lights back on. Great, thanks. What I want to show you is the inside of a fluorescent tube. Now, unlike a light bulb, a regular incandescent light bulb, there's no wire that runs down the middle and glows. Instead, this was filled with a gas, or it was filled with a gas. And an electrode at the end of the tube, you can see it right here, it's that wire, creates an electrical discharge, which makes a plasma. And the plasma makes the coating inside the bulb glow. Now, you can make a plasma at home. All you need to do is take a grape. So if you do this at home, you could actually light your microwave on fire, you could destroy the microwave, you could light your house on fire, and you could make noxious fumes. So don't. Each half of the grape acts like an electrode, like the ones at the end of the fluorescent tube. An electric discharge between the grapes creates the plasma. How could a thing like that affect our everyday lives? It has a huge impact. Every electronic appliance we have depends on a plasma. For example, the plasma etches the lines that make up the circuits in this board. And plasmas appear in our lives in even more mundane ways. For example, this chip bag is made from mylar. It's a very thin plastic. And to get ink to stick to it, the manufacturers blast it with a plasma, and then the ink readily adheres to the bag. Yeah, come in. It, uh, it fell. Is that my lunch? Yeah, that's your voltmeter, too. Here, have a chip.
Daily Minutes zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren via PI2 NOS. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2027 with a release date of Friday, September 2nd, 2016 to follow in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The following is a QST. There's a new national park for hams to activate. A special event station finds two Indiana ham clubs marking a special air show. Youngsters in South Africa sample the International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend. And hams are at the ready as weather threatens the Atlantic coast and Hawaii. All of this coming your way in Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2027. From around the world, this is Newsline. Amateur Radio's first and only independent, on-the-air news and bulletin service. Now, here is Skeeter Nash, N5ASH. Our newscast opens this week as more storms threaten to bear down in different parts of the U.S. As Amateur Radio Newsline went to production, hams were going into a state of preparedness. As we hear from Amateur Radio Newsline's Bobby Best. WX4ALA. Multiple tropical systems are poised to affect the U.S. over the next 48 hours, and amateur radio operators in multiple states have been called on to assist with emergency communications. The area of greatest concern right now is Tropical Storm Hermine in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's sitting like a cock pistol aimed at Apalachicola, Tallahassee, and areas near this region of the Florida Panhandle. Late Wednesday night, the National Hurricane Center issued hurricane warnings for coastal and inland areas from just east of Panama City, east to Cross City, Florida, as well as inland areas that include nine counties due north of this coastal region up to the Florida-Georgia state line. Outside of this hurricane warning area, there are tropical storm warnings from Eglin Air Force Base east along the coast to just north of Tampa and then north and east, including the Dothan, Alabama area and parts of southern Georgia. Plus, a tropical storm watch is in effect up into portions of southern South Carolina. Tuesday in a press conference, Florida Governor Rick Scott said, quote, Our State Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, is at level two, and we have 8,000 members of the National Guard ready to be mobilized if needed, end quote. Florida Aries has been activated, and members are manning the state EOC. Additionally, over 50 counties in Florida have already been declared to be under a state of emergency. And emergency management and Aries on the county level across much of Florida have their county EOCs activated and manned by hams also. Plus, WX4 NHC, the amateur station at the National Hurricane Center, is active through the National Hurricane Center net on 20 meters at 14 dollars. 325 megahertz with their primary net. For additional information on the National Hurricane Center net, visit their website at wx4nhc.org. Beyond the current watches and warnings that cover up to 48 hours out, with landfall anticipated late Thursday night as a Category 1 hurricane, the tract of Hermine takes it up the east coast, north of Washington, D.C., up to the New York State area late Sunday, when it should start to make an eastward turn, according to the latest model data. If Hermine wasn't enough, hams in Hawaii are bracing for not one, but two tropical systems over the next 72 hours. Tropical Storm Madeline is tracking south, the big island of Hawaii, moving westward as of Wednesday night, local Hawaii time, and is predicted to lose strength. However, behind Madeline is Hurricane Lester. Lester is expected to move across the main Hawaii islands as a Category 1 hurricane between Saturday and Sunday, local Hawaii time. As it tracks northwestward across the islands, it should continue to weaken, though. Aries members in Hawaii are already activated in support of the big island effort with Tropical Storm Madeline, and additional Aries members will be activated as needed to support emergency communications efforts through Lester's track through the islands. Without a doubt, this is going to be a very active holiday weekend for hams. If it weren't enough, though, a new tropical wave has just formed in the far eastern Atlantic. This tropical wave was located a few hundred miles west of the Cabo Verde Islands. This wave will bear watching around the time our current storms are clearing out and the wave is reaching the Lesser Antilles. Reporting from Jasper, Alabama, I'm Bobby Best, WX4ALA. Meanwhile, in India, monsoonal rains have led to deadly flooding, and amateurs have been activated to provide emergency communications. 
At least 300 have lost their lives as villages in the eastern region were evacuated and residents sought higher ground. In central India, JU VU2JAU reports that hams have been deployed to help prevent flood-related accidents as the water levels deepen. The Ganges River floods are reported to have broken previous records as water levels reached unprecedented levels at four locations in the north. The highest record was measured in the state of Bihar, where flood waters reached 50.52 meters or 166 feet as of August 26th. The United States National Park System is celebrating its centennial by welcoming amateur radio operators into the parks from coast to coast to work the bands and possibly the world. Now, there's one more scenic wilderness to consider, thanks to a gift from a foundation created by a multimillionaire businesswoman. Amateur Radio Newsline's Heather Emby, KB3TZD, tells us more. Just call it MN84. The nation's newest national monument within the U.S. National Park Service is much more than that, of course. It's just under 87,500 acres in northern Maine, and it will be known as the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. The land donation, valued at $100 million, was given to the federal government by Elliottsville Plantation Incorporated, a foundation created by philanthropist Roxanne Quimby, who created the property over a period of years by buying parcels up from lumber companies. It's not far from Maine's Baxter State Park and Mount Katahdin, the highest peak in Maine. National Parks on the Air participants are now able to make plans for the site, which features the east branch of the Penobscot River and a section of the Maine woods popular among cross-country skiers, snowshoers, canoers, and fishing enthusiasts. Add to that list now all of those amateur radio operators who will no doubt soon be setting their sights on MN84. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Heather Emby, KB3TZD. Pilots and amateur radio operators share a love of being on the air, so the combination seemed natural for one special event station in Indiana. Amateur Radio Newsline's Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, tells us how hams and an annual air show honor the memory of one local pilot. A special event station operated in a joint effort by two radio clubs will take place in Madison, Indiana, on Sunday, September 18th. The Clifty Amateur Radio Society, W9EFU, and the Ivy Tech Community College Madison Campus Amateur Radio Club, KC9WQI, will be operating in conjunction with the 15th annual Riley Memorial Air Show. The fly-in is in memory of the late Dr. H. Shermer Riley, a local physician who was also an avid pilot and the co-author of the book Two Pilots, One Engine, which describes his flight around the world. A lifelong pilot, he died in April of 2010. Clifty Amateur Radio Club officer and faculty sponsor of the Ivy Tech Club, Jerry Barnes, KA9PIJ, explains the cooperation of the two clubs. We run a lot of our projects together. We ran field field day together. Uh, we were going to do the uh, the air show together, so people can receive a certificate. Uh, if they're lucky enough, they're going to make contact with uh, both groups uh, on the same day. Listen for the clubs near 7.268 on 40 meters, 14.268 on 20 meters, and 28.440 on 10 meters. To get your electronic certificate for working the special event, submit your request to KA9PIJ at SynergyMetro.net. That's C-I-N-E-R-G-Y-M-E-T-R-O dot net by Friday, September 25th. Certificates for valid contacts will only be sent to your email address. No printed QSL cards will be available. Reporting for Amateur Radio Newsline in beautiful southern Indiana, I'm Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. The activation of Avis Island, a much-coveted DXCC entity, has been postponed. Amateur Radio Newsline's Stephen Kinford, N8WB, tells disappointed amateurs why it's not going forward at least for now. If you've been waiting for the big D expedition to Avis Island, one of the world's top DXCC entities, you may have to wait a little while longer, or even longer than that. Steve W4DTA reports that the plans for YX0V have been put on hold due to weather conditions. The activation was to have started in late August. Reporting on behalf of the team, Steve indicated that safety concerns were paramount, especially in the light of the potential for storms. He hoped to provide updates in time. The expedition was to have operated for as many as 10 days, concluding on September 10th. Now its future is unclear. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Stephen Kinford, NAWB in Wadsworth, Ohio. Time for you to identify your station. 
We are the Amateur Radio Newsline, heard on bulletin stations around the world, including WA6TST, the linked repeater system of the Barstow, California Amateur Radio Club, on Tuesdays. Ham Radio Outlet has opened its doors at the Milwaukee store that had once been headquarters to Amateur Electronic Supply, and a number of AES employees have been hired on to continue working at that location. Amateur Electronic Supply announced several weeks ago that after 59 years, it was going out of the ham radio business. The Milwaukee store has since been renovated and has become the largest such retail outlet operated by HRO. The company announced its Saturday, August 27th opening on Twitter, generating big excitement on social media. The store, with a total of 5,000 square feet, is considered to be HRO's superstore. While fans of Britain's Brian Ricks will miss his comedic talents and his presence on stage and screen, amateur radio operators are grieving too. The bands will be that much emptier without him. We hear more from Amateur Radio Newsline's Jeremy Boot, G4NJH. The amateur radio world, along with the entertainment world and the world of disability advocates, are all mourning the death of British actor Brian Ricks, G2DQU, an honorary vice president of the Radio Society of Great Britain, Lord Ricks died on Saturday the 20th of August in London. A radio amateur since his early teens, he credited his older brother Malcolm, G5GX, with first sparking that interest when they were children. Lord Ricks became an actor as a young man and was later to enter the realms of politics as well as charity. An advocate for the rights of those with disability, he became president of MENCAP, an organisation that helps people with learning disabilities. He was knighted in 1986 and began service in the House of Lords in 1992, taking particular interest in issues that impacted upon telecommunications and any matters having to do with amateur radio, including the fight against interference from the polluting power line telecommunications technology. Brian Ricks became a silent key at age 92. Vale, Brian Ricks, G2DQU, silent key. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jeremy Bucci for NJH. A group of young South African amateurs known as the Hammies helped activate a well-known lighthouse in the city of Port Elizabeth. Amateur Radio Newsline's Graham Kemp, VK4BB, tells us why these kids are likely to consider this year's International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend one to remember. Donkin Reserve is a noted historical spot in the South African city of Port Elizabeth, but on Sunday the 21st of August it also made some history for a group of youngsters and their ham radios. The Eastern Cape Hammies Club, ZS2ZU, worked the bands during the International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend with the help of the Port Elizabeth Amateur Radio Society, ZS2PE. The youngsters landed some DX contacts and worked nine other lighthouses from the one at the reserve, which was built in 1861. The young amateurs also got another experience worthy of the history books. They worked the bands from a microbus fitted out with radios and antennas and owned by Al Asker's ZS2U. The camper became their radio shack for several hours and though it never moved from its parking spot, it nevertheless transported the youngsters for miles and miles over the radio waves. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Graham Kemp, VK4BB. Member. In the world of DX, Bob, VK2BOB, will work from Samoa as 5W0BOB between September 10th and 17th. Listen for him on 40 and 20 meters using mainly SSB. Send QSL cards via VK2BOB direct only. His log will be uploaded to Club Log. Gordon, K7TRB, will use the call sign 7P8VA from Masaru in Lesotho between now and November 5th. He will be on the bands from 80 to 10 meters and possibly on 6 meters as well. Listen for him on SSB and in the digital modes. Send QSLs to his home call sign direct by the Bureau and check to see if he is on Logbook of the World. As of press time, he had not yet decided. Alejandro, LU9VEA, will be on Easter Island working as CE0Y stroke LU9VEA between September 26th and 30th. Listen for him on a variety of HF bands working SSB. Send QSL cards to IK2DUW. 
In Santana, Madeira Island, listen for Dieter, DK4QT, Thomas, DL6TK, Calais, DM3BJ, and a few others starting September 19th and running through the 28th. They'll be active as CT9 stroke home call on 80 through 10 meters using CW, SSB, and RTTY. They also plan to be in the CQWWDX Ritty Contest, which is taking place September 24th and 25th, signing as cr 3 W. Send QSLs to CR3W via DL5AXX. Send QSLs to all others via their home call signs. Think you've been a ham for a long time? Meet Cliff Kehart, who's had his license for 79 years. And that's just a fraction of his lifetime. Cliff, W4KKP, is 104 years old. We hear from him now as Amateur Radio Newsline's Paul Brown WD9GCO closes out this week's newscast with a few reflections from this very seasoned OM. There are OMs in amateur radio, and then there are really OMs. Cliff Kehart, W4KKP of White Rock, South Carolina, definitely falls into the latter category. Kehart is 104 years old and has been an active, licensed ham for 79 years and counting. I recently had the privilege of speaking with Mr. Kehart, who was first licensed in 1937. I asked him how he got interested in amateur radio. Well, uh, as a kid, I think I was 10 years old, a buddy of mine came along and put earphones on my head, and I heard radio for the first time. I lived about 10 miles from the Bell Laboratories there in, in New Jersey, and they, they were experimenting all the time with uh, broadcasting. So uh, a big light lit up, and I, I said, this is for me, and it turned out to be that way. I worked in radio all of my life. In fact, his hobby earned him one of his first adult jobs. So having been active in radio since I was a kid, I built every radio that I could find a circuit diagram on, and uh, uh, I did that for quite a long time, just a kid. And I saw that RCA was looking for uh, somebody with my experience, so I wrote the letter. They called me in, and when I got there, they said, well, you have no experience. I said, yes, I do. I've been building radios since I was a young kid, and I'm still building them. I've been using your tubes for a long time. I know how your tubes work, what they're designed to do, and what circuits are best uh, useful in. So I said, I tell you what, why don't you uh, hire me for one month, and uh, if I don't pan out, fire me. I worked there for five years. Kehart is still quite active on the air. Even moving into a retirement home couldn't stop him. I, I'm living in a in sort of a retirement place here. I, I sort of missed my radio, ham radio, right away because I had been very active uh, ever since the war was over and uh, still enjoyed it. But I came down here and living in this home, I, I wondered, could I have radio in here? So I... Uh, Talked around a little bit, and I got permission to install my radio equipment here. Local uh, amateurs in a local radio club, they volunteered to come down and put up my antenna, and they put up a nice uh, 52-foot center-fed antenna, and it's worked beautifully. The lead-in is a balanced ladder line. And I've I've worked in Australia from here, and uh, I work all over the place uh, in the, the United States. Right now, I'm the 40-meter band, but I work all bands from here. So I'm enjoying radio. So listen for W4KKP on the air and try to work the man who may possibly be the oldest active ham in the world. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. There are a lot more stories Cliff K. Hart has to tell. To hear more about his experiences on and off the air, listen to his full conversation with Paul Brown in an Amateur Radio Newsline Extra. Just visit our website, arnewsline.org, and navigate to the Extra page. With thanks to Allen Labs, the ARRL, the BBC, CQ Magazine, CNN, DX News, DX Coffee, Hap Holly and the Rain Report, Ham Radio Outlet, Irish Radio Transmitter Society, Internet Movie Database, the London Telegraph, Ohio Pen DX Bulletin, Port Elizabeth Amateur Radio Society, QRZ, Southgate Amateur Radio News, Ted Randall's QSO Radio Show, Wireless Institute of Australia, WTWW Shortwave, and you, our listeners, that's all from Amateur Radio Newsline. 
please send emails to our address at newsline at arnewsline.org. More information is available at Amateur Radio Newsline's only official website, located at www.arnewsline.org. For now, with Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the News Desk in New York, and our news team worldwide, I'm Skeeter Nash, N5ASH in Topeka, Kansas, saying 7-3. And as always, we thank you for listening. Amateur Radio Newsline is copyright 2016, all rights reserved. Hallo, liebe SWLs, YLs und OM. Sie hören den Deutschlandrundspruch Nummer 35 des Deutschen Amateurradioclubs für die 35. Kalenderwoche 2016. Diesmal haben wir Meldungen zu folgenden Themen. Der RBB sendete einen Amateurfunkbeitrag im Fernsehen. Das HAARP setzt Betrieb im Jahr 2017 fort. Bernd Schneider, Delta Bravo 3, Papa Alpha, Silent Key. Dann gibt es einen Stratosphärenballonstart am 9. September. Dann noch einmal der Hinweis auf die 61. UKW-Tagung. Distrikts Service Tag in Bayern Ost, das ist der Distrikt Uniform. Aktuelle Conteste und was gibt es Neues vom Funkwetter. Zum ersten Thema im Deutschlandrundspruch. Der Rundfunk Berlin Brandenburg sendete Amateurfunkbeitrag im Fernsehen. Am 24. August strahlte der TV-Sender RBB Fernsehen einen Beitrag über Amateurfunk aus. OVV Wolfgang Mayer, Delta Lima 7 Alpha Juliet, beschreibt in einem E-Mail die Vorgeschichte. Er schreibt, der Redakteur dieses Beitrags, Boris Römer, hatte mich angerufen, weil ihm diese Antennen am Stuttgarter Platz in Berlin aufgefallen waren. Herr Römer hatte den Beitrag genauso gebracht, wie er es mir von Anfang an schilderte. Die Antennen sehen, neugierig sein, was oder wer dahinter steckt, die Person und das Hobby näher beschreiben. Das ist ihm meiner Meinung nach auch genauso gelungen. Ab Minute 32.40 wird im Beitrag über den Amateurfunk die Station von Delta Charlie 7 Yankee Sierra vorgestellt. Sehr beeindruckend und meiner Meinung nach auch sehr gut gemacht. Geplant ist auch noch ein separater Beitrag über Notfunk. Zitat Ende. Der Beitrag kann in der Mediathek des Senders abgerufen werden. Alternativ ist der Beitrag auch auf der Internetvideoplattform YouTube abrufbar. Das HAARP setzt Betrieb im Jahr 2017 fort. Laut dem amerikanischen Amateurfunkverband ARRL soll das High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, kurz HAARP, Anfang 2017 wieder den Betrieb aufnehmen. Bei der Anlage im US-Bundesstaat Alaska handelt es sich um eine Einrichtung zur Erforschung der Ionosphäre, die seit 1993 vorwiegend von der US Air Force genutzt wurde. Auf einer Fläche von etwa 13 Hektar sind 180 Kreuzdipole in 15 Reihen zu 12 Antennen aufgebaut, die im Bereich von 2,8 bis 10 Megahertz genutzt werden können. Für die Versuche stehen bis zu 3,6 Megawatt Leistung zur Verfügung. Die ARRL hat sich seit der Außerbetriebnahme im Jahr 2014 für den Fortbestand der Anlage eingesetzt, der sogar ein Abriss drohte. In der Folge übernahm das Geophysikalische Institut der Universität Fairbanks die Anlage. Bernd Schneider, Delta Bravo 3, Papa Alpha, Silent Key. In der Nacht auf den 30. August ist OM Bernd Schneider, Delta Bravo 3, Papa Alpha, im Alter von 63 Jahren gestorben. OM Bernd war 43 Jahre im DARC e.V. Mitglied und zudem Träger der Goldenen Ehrennadel. Er konnte auf eine lange Liste von zahlreichen Ämtern im Club zurückblicken. Er war OVV des Ortsverbandes Taunus, Foxlot 27, Distriktsvorsitzender Hessen, Mitglied im Personal- und Ehrennadelausschuss des Amateurrates, darüber hinaus Mitglied im Juristischen Arbeitskreis, stellvertretender Sprecher des Amateurrates, Jugendschutzbeauftragter und bis zuletzt aktiver Datenschutzbeauftragter des Bundesverbandes. Bei den vergangenen Mitgliederversammlungen fungierte er als Moderator der öffentlichen Diskussion um die vorliegenden Anträge, fasste das Meinungsbild zusammen und empfahl der Versammlung aufgrund der vorherigen Diskussion die Annahme oder Ablehnung. Lehnung eines Antrages. Der DARC e.V. verliert mit ihm ein sehr engagiertes und verdientes Mitglied. Unser Mitgefühl gilt seinen Angehörigen und Freunden. 
Stratosphärenballonstart am 9. September. Die Ortsverbände Meschede, Oskar 30 und Hochsauerland, Zulu 92, starten am 9. September in der Zeit zwischen 9 und 11 Uhr einen Wetterballon. Der Start erfolgt in Kooperation mit der Bürgerstiftung Meschede und dem Gymnasium der Stadt Meschede. Schüler des Gymnasiums haben unter der Leitung ihres Physiklehrers auf der Basis eines Arduinos eine Nutzlast entwickelt, die während des Flugverlaufs die Temperatur, den Luftdruck und die Luftfeuchtigkeit aufzeichnet. Durch die Funkamateure wird eine weitere Nutzlast beigesteuert, welche die Messwerte der Temperatur, des Luftdrucks, der Luftfeuchtigkeit sowie die aktuelle Höhe als Sprachausgabe abstrahlt. Die Aussendung erfolgt auf dem PMR-Kanal 3 auf 446 40,03125 MHz. Diese Frequenz wurde bewusst gewählt, um den Schülern mit einfachen Mitteln und einer Vielzahl von zur Verfügung stehenden Geräten das Verfolgen der Aussendungen zu ermöglichen. Die Erfahrungen der vergangenen Mission zeigen, dass die Aussendungen in ganz Norddeutschland zu empfangen sein sollten. Der Kurs des Ballons kann im Internet auf der Webseite aprs.fi unter Delta Lima 0 Mike Echo Sierra DL0 ME verfolgt werden. Empfangsberichte werden gern entgegengenommen. Aktuelle Informationen und Kontakt gibt es über Facebook. Darüber berichtet Josef Sommer, Delta Lima 8, Delta Bravo November. 61. UKW-Tagung Weinheim. Die 61. Weinheimer UKW-Tagung findet vom 9. bis 11. September statt. Veranstaltungsbeginn ist am Freitag mit einem Hemmfest auf dem Clubgelände von Delta Lima 0 Whisky Hotel. Der Samstag wartet mit einem großen Vortragsprogramm, einer Amateurfunkausstellung und Funkflohmarkt in der Dietrich-Bonnhöfer-Schule, Multrink Nummer 76 bis 78 in 69 469 Weinheim auf. Das Tagungsgelände ist für Besucher ab 7 Uhr zugänglich, die Hallen für die Ausstellung und der Vortragsbereich mitsamt der Mensa öffnen ab 8 Uhr. Das Vortragsprogramm beginnt ab 9.15 Uhr. Die Vorträge behandeln in diesem Jahr unter anderem folgende Themen. Leistungs- und Intermodulationsmessungen an Breitbandverstärkern, Empfängerbau mit sogenannten Gainblocks, Reflexion an Raumfahrzeugen, Milliwattmeter mit Arduino Uno, praktische Anwendung von Operationsverstärkern im VHF-Bereich. Am Samstagabend trifft man sich erneut auf dem Clubgelände von Delta Lima 0 Whisky Hotel. Die Veranstaltung endet mit dem Brunch bei DL0WH am Sonntag ab 10 Uhr, wobei auch eine Tagungsnachlese mit Kofferraum, Flohmarkt und Workshops auf dem Programm stehen. Zur Tagung wird wie jedes Jahr ein Selbstbauwettbewerb angeboten, dessen Ausschreibung auf der Tagungswebseite nachzulesen ist. Die UKW-Tagung wird vom gemeinnützigen Funkamateurclub Weinheim, kurz FACW -E und dem DARC Ortsverband Weinheim Alpha 20 auf ehrenamtlich Basis veranstaltet. Distriktservicetag in Bayern Ost, Distrikt Uniform. Der Distrikt Bayern Ost, Uniform, lädt zu seinem ersten Distriktservicetag am 17. September ein. Veranstaltungsort ist der Berggasthof Menauer am Granzberg Nummer 6 in 94 374 Schwarzach. Zwischen 9 und 16 Uhr erwartet die Besucher ein abwechslungsreiches Programm. Folgende Programmpunkte bzw. Vortragsthemen stehen unter anderem auf der Agenda. Der Perseus Web SDR, Hemnet Einstieg leicht gemacht, ARDF Schnupperwettbewerb, Einstieg in die Betriebsart C4FM, Besichtigung der Relaisfunkstelle Delta Bravo 0 Romeo Delta Hotel DB0 RDH, Vorstellung WRTC 2018 in Deutschland, Selbstbau eines 40 Meter QRP CW Transceivers, Vorstellung Castle on the Air kurz COTA. Um einen Überblick über die zu erwartenden Besucher zu bekommen, bitten die Veranstalter um eine unverbindliche Voranmeldung über das vertrauliche Doodle-Formular, welches über die Distriktswebseite zu erreichen ist. Die Distriktsvorstandschaft Bayern Ost und die Referenten freuen sich auf zahlreiche Teilnehmer. Ein weiterer Servicetag findet mit demjenigen des Distriktes Berlin am gleichen Tag statt. Am 24. des Monats veranstalten die Distrikte Rheinland-Pfalz und Saar gemeinsam einen ähnlichen Event. Über beide Veranstaltungen berichtete bereits der Deutschlandrundspruch in der vergangenen Woche. 
Aktuelle Conteste am 3. September, da startet die AGCW DL Handtastenparty auf 40 Meter. Das gesamte Wochenende hindurch, 3. bis 4. September, der JARL All Asian DX Contest, außerdem der IARU Region 1 SSB Field Day sowie der IARU Region 1 145 MHz September Contest. Außerdem noch am 4. September der DARC 10 Meter Digital Contest Corona. Am 5. September findet die QCWA QSO Party statt. Am nächsten Wochenende, 10. bis 11. September, da läuft der WAE DX Contest. Die Ausschreibungen finden Sie auf der Webseite des DX und HR Funksportreferates sowie mittels der Contest Termintabelle in der CQDL in der aktuellen September-Ausgabe 9 2016 auf Seite 70. Der Funkwetterbericht vom 30. August, herausgegeben von Hartmut Büttig, DL1VDL. Zunächst der Rückblick vom 23. bis 29. August. Der August verabschiedete sich mit DX-Bedingungen, die deutlich herbstlichen Charakter tragen. 20 und 30 Meter öffneten morgens und abends mit lauten Signalen in den pazifischen Raum. Auch 17 Meter überraschte uns auf den Taglinien. Der bisher beste DX-Tag war der 23. August, an dem abends sogar das 12. Meterband öffnete. Die unteren Bänder bescherten bei ruhigem geomagnetischem Feld DX-Signale von VP6 oder ZL. Vier Sonnenflecken sorgten für leicht gestiegene Fluxwerte, exakt von 81 auf 88 Fluxeinheiten. Das Erdmagnetfeld war meist ruhig, merkliche Störungen gab es am 23. und 24. August. Am 28. und 29. August wurden nach längerer Pause insgesamt vier C-Flares beobachtet. Die sporadik e saison ist noch nicht ganz beendet, sie dauerte diesmal deutlich länger als in den Vorjahren. Vorhersage bis zum 6. September, die Anzahl der Sonnenflecken sinkt bereits, sodass wir etwa am Wochenende wieder sehr ruhige solare Bedingungen haben werden. Bis dahin sind noch einzelne C-Flares möglich. Wir erwarten Fluxwerte zwischen 90 und 80, aber mit leicht fallender Tendenz. Das geomagnetische Feld wird nur leicht gestört sein, da wir in den Einflussbereich eines koronalen Loches mit positiver Polarität kommen. Die unteren Bänder sind zunehmend DX-tauglich und die Signale aus dem pazifischen Raum sind an den meisten Tagen brauchbar bis gut. Die stabilsten DX-Bänder bleiben 30 und 20 Meter, wobei man 17 und 15 Meter durchaus beobachten sollte. Und hier nur noch die Orientierungszeiten für Greyline DX, alle Zeiten in UTC, Sonnenaufgang in Neuseeland ist um 18.42 Uhr, in Ostaustralien um 20.42 Uhr, in Westaustralien um 22.34 Uhr, in Singapur, da geht die Sonne auf um 23 Uhr Weltzeit, in Japan um 20.12 Uhr, auf Hawaii um 16.14 Uhr, in Anchorage in Alaska, dort geht die Sonne auf um 14.48 Uhr UTC. In Johannesburg in Südafrika um 4.20 Uhr. An der USA-Westküste in Kalifornien um 13.40 Uhr. Auf den Falklandinseln um 10.34 Uhr. Und in Berlin in Deutschland geht die Sonne um 4.16 Uhr Weltzeit auf. Sonnenuntergang USA-Ostküste 23.28 Uhr. USA-Westküste 2.39 Uhr. In Sao Paulo in Brasilien, dort geht die Sonne unter um 20.55 Uhr UTC, auf den Falklandinseln um 21.20 Uhr, auf Hawaii um 4.47 Uhr, in Anchorage in Alaska, dort geht die Sonne unter um 5 Uhr und 3 Minuten Weltzeit, in Johannesburg in Südafrika um 15.55 Uhr, in Neuseeland um 5.59 Uhr und in Berlin in Deutschland verschwindet die Sonne um 17.55 Uhr UTC hinter dem Horizont. Das war der DARC Deutschland Rundspruch für diese Woche. Die Redaktion hatte Stefan Hüpper, Delta Hotel 5, Foxtrot, Foxtrot Lima vom Amateurfunkmagazin CQDL. Diesen Rundspruch gibt's auch als PDF und MP3 Datei auf der DARC Webseite sowie in Packet Radio unter der Rubrik DARC. Meldungen für den Deutschlandrundspruch, also mit bundesweiter Relevanz, schicken Sie bitte per Post oder Fax an die Redaktion CQDL sowie per E-Mail bitte ausschließlich an die Adresse redaktion.darc.de. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören und AWDH bis zur nächsten Woche. PA00 News füllende Udsendelse inneholder nogle schockierende Exempler på, hvordan en hobby kan ändre liv i unge under 18. 
Kraftigt til stedeværelsen af en voksen anbefales. Ik wil heel graag nog even wijzen op de repeater PI3 UTR, die tenslotte deze uitzending in grote mate mogelijk maakt. Je kunt de repeater sponsoren op de website van PI3 UTR. Uh, zo repeater, daar wordt altijd aan geknutseld, dus eigenlijk zijn altijd alle middelen welkom en bedenk hoeveel inzet het kost om, uh, en gekost heeft om de repeater op deze plek te krijgen en dit fantastische bereik uh, te realiseren. Dus allemaal naar pi3utr.nl 7, 8, 4, 0, 5, 1, 2, 7, 4, 8, 9, 7. Achtung, alle Mitarbeiter der Nachrichtendienste. Bitte beachten Sie freitagabends die Sendungen PA00 News für die wichtigsten weitere Informationen. Dit is Papa Alpha 0 Echo Tango Echo.